Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. This for the week of 21st to 27th of December 2020. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host Jean Deville. Before getting into this week's episode, a special shout out to our friends at GoTigerNots and SpaceWatch.Global. Also, I would recommend、uh, we would recommend that you check out our recent interview with Kevin Shu from Landspace, available on our YouTube channel. We've had a lot of excellent feedback so far, and we are、uh, pretty happy with with how it turned out in terms of、uh, discussion. I think Kevin and I,、uh, Kevin discussed a lot of interesting、uh, interesting points. So be sure to check that out. And if it's your first time here, also、uh, recommend checking out our previous news episodes.、Uh, we usually keep them fairly brief. Uh, so this week we have about、uh, a number of different topics that we're going to provide updates on.、Uh, that includes、uh, a long-term plan for the Chinese、uh, space station,、uh, as well as some information on some lunar resource extraction plans.、Uh, but first, a review of the Long March 8 launch that occurred this past week. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. 士兵先生，边境空中飞行时间两小时十五分钟。我们预计在当地时间下午六点二十五分左右到达。Early this week, we saw the first launch of the Long March 8、uh, from Wenchang in, in Hainan Province. As we discussed last week, there were five satellites on board the rocket, which were a very diverse、uh, mix of both commercial,、uh, state-owned, and also some、uh, more secretive sort of military EO satellites, and also some international collaboration satellites、uh, with an Ethiopian partner.、Uh, there were a couple of updates though this week on some of the payloads,、uh, which sort of revealed some interesting partners that we had not previously known at the time of,、uh, of last week's recording. Uh, this included、uh, Ping An, which is the、uh, China's largest insurer. It's a Shenzhen-based company that has previously had、uh, a little bit of involvement in space through some of its VCs investing in some、uh, kind of Shenzhen-based kind of、uh, space space companies.、Um, but this is,、uh, as far as I know, the first time that Ping An is launching its own dedicated satellite.、Um, so basically, the Tianqi-8 satellite, which was a Guodiangaoka satellite,、um, was also named apparently Ping An One. Um, and Ping An released an article that talked about having、uh, their own、um, sort of satellite IoT network type of, of plan,、um, which seems to be related to the company's broader kind of smart city initiatives. So、um, I recall、uh, in 2019 at the China High Tech Fair in Shenzhen, which I think John also was was attending,、uh, Ping An had a large booth in the smart city section of the of the convention. So they seem to have these kind of broader smart city initiatives. And are collaborating with、uh, companies like Wuhan Gaoke to be launching their own satellites. So it's interesting to see this is a huge company with something like, I think it's eight trillion RMB in assets under management,、um, something like that. So I mean, it, it is basically China's largest insurer,、uh, getting involved in the space industry.、Um, one other point on that satellite that I think is worth noting is that within this Ping An article, there was a table of different satellites in the. Uh, Guodian Gaoke Tianqi constellation, and each of the satellites was, you know, Tianqi One, Tianqi Two, etc. But then several of them had sort of alternative names、um, underneath, you know, Tianqi Four, whatever. So、uh, a couple of them were were different cities that appear apparently are cooperating、uh, with Guodian Gaoke to launch satellites. So, for example, there was a a, a satellite called、uh, Changzhou、uh, One. So Changzhou is C A N G Z H O U、um, is a city, and I I don't know the The province. I won't even foster a guess. But digressing,、um, another city, another satellite called、uh, Xinzhou, which is another city in. Again, I, I don't know the province. These are relatively small cities. That one may be in、uh, Shanxi, but、um, don't quote me on that.、Uh, digressing. I think it's interesting also then that Guodian Gaoke is seemingly cooperating with a lot of different cities.、Um, That are each wanting to launch their own individual sort of IoT satellite or some kind of test satellite,、um, and some of them are, are basically probably just some marketing or or other kind of、um, having some city university or otherwise that could use this satellite.、Um, but it, it it seems like an interesting way that that Guodiangaoke is then sort of building out its own constellation, and so I think it's it, it will be important to watch whether there's sort of a、um, Some of parts being greater than the whole, in the sense that Guodian Gaoke is sort of collaborating with all these different, relatively smaller space、uh, stakeholders, you could call them,、um, and, and then building this larger network.
and potentially offering some services, um, whether IoT or otherwise, based on that network. So um, yeah, those were that was the the noteworthy um, points from the Long March eight from my side. Uh, Jean, anything from you on the Long March eight launch uh, this week that that you had not been able to cover last week? Mm. Uh, I think it's also worth mentioning an, 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 another satellite that was launched by Space-T on this launch, which was the HiC-1 satellite. I think it's mm. interesting for two reasons, because I think SAR is something that's quite lacking today um, in in more generally in China's um, Earth observation capabilities. It's also worth noting that on this satellite, you had uh, the iodine thrusters of a French company called ThrustMe. And it's interesting to see that this is the third collaboration between Space-T and ThrustMe. Um, and last point, I think that Space T built themselves the SAR payload that you have on this satellite. So it's also worth noting uh, that Space T, which is initially, it's I mean, its core, mm. um, its its core competencies, really building satellite platforms, that they've really extended um, to building the payloads also. And uh, SAR seems to be their their first move. It's something that they called Minisar. Apart from that, I think that's it for Long March 8. And maybe moving on to our next piece of news, which I think is the um, maybe the largest piece of news this week, was a significant mm. update that we got regarding China's um, crude space program. So namely the Chinese space station. Um, a little background on how it happened. So um, on the 25th of December this year, a couple of days ago, there was a ceremony that was held in Changsha uh, in Hunan province in China. And it was a ceremony to celebrate the transfer of the Shenzhou 10 spacecraft into Changsha, where it would be exposed and showed in different areas of um, of the province. And so Shenzhou 10 was a spacecraft that was launched on the on, in 2013 with three Taikonauts on board the Shenzhou spacecraft. It docked with the um, Tiangong Experimental Space Station and returned to the ground. And what they're doing right now is they're planning to expose the re-entry module, uh, notably in, in, in Shaoshan and also in, in Changsha, I believe. And they're doing this for two reasons, I, I think. there's The first reason is that next year is quite a symbolic year for China. It's the 100th uh, anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. So it's quite big for the government. They have to um, put forward some of um, China's great successes, and Shenzhou is one of them. Um, and the other reason is that they chose Hunan because Hunan is the, and in and, and Shaoshan even more, it's the birthplace of Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong, first chairman of the People's Republic of China. And they're also he's also interesting in this um, space context because he's considered by many in China as uh, the father of Chinese space in the sense that he initiated one of the first programs called, um, I think it was called, yeah, Two Bombs, One Satellite. So basically the ballistic missile program in China in the 60s that led to the Long March um, series. And um, uh, well, digressing here, what was interesting was not really the ceremony in itself, but what happened before the ceremony, there was a journalist from China Space News that had uh, the opportunity to interview some of the high profile attendees. And one of those was um, so a guy called Zhou Jianping. He's the chief engineer of the crude space flight program. So not just anybody. And he gave some really nice insights on, um, well, what China was planning for its crude space flight program and notably its timeline. And so to give some mention of what he said, um, first of all, the launch of the core module of the Chinese space station called uh, the core module is called Tianhe. This would be launched. Uh, next year in the first half of 2021 on board a Long March 5B. And then after that, there'd be two launches successively of uh, Tianzhou 2, so a cargo spacecraft, and um, also Shenzhou 12 uh, with three Taikonauts on board, then Shenzhou, um, Tianzhou 3 and Shenzhou 13. And so these five launches together would consist in what they call uh, the key technology verification phase. So basically, the Taikonauts would be checking, you know, if the core module is working fine, the robotic arm is okay, the power systems are all good, and they perform some extravehicular activity, that sort of stuff. And after that, once this uh, verification phase is, is done, then there'd be two more launches of Tianzhou cargo, so t two more launches of Shenzhou as well, and they would launch into space the two remaining uh, modules of the space station, which are called uh, Meng Tian and Wang Tian, and which are this time more dedicated to sciences. All of this would actually happen within two years, so in 2021 and 2022. And that's quite, really, that's quite crazy when you think of it. Like the last Shenzhou launch was four or five years ago. It was Shenzhou 11. I think that took place in 2016. And now we're having 11 launches in two years. So I think that definitely uh, China's crude space program will, will will be in the spotlight in the two coming years and overcome um, the lunar program, especially since the next 
lunar launch. I think it's um, it's uh, Chang'e 6 in 2023. So uh, that's in quite a bit of time. And so really, I think 2021 and 2022 will be the year of uh, crewed space flight um, for, for China. A- any thoughts on that, Blaine? I, I think as as mentioned, I mean that the biggest, the most striking part of this this update, I think, is the the ambition that it involves. I mean, if this if this is done in the next two years, uh, while China is also doing these things like Chang'e five that we just saw, or or the upcoming Chang'e six, as you mentioned, and, and then Chang'e seven and eight, um, and and the 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 uh, Mars mission that was just said this past summer, you know, I mean, all, all these things. And as, as we mentioned, I, I believe in the last episode, possibly two episodes ago, just this idea that um, as space becomes a, a bigger thing and as governments are, are I guess, more inclined to uh, put money into having a space program. I mean, for, for example, I think over the last uh, five to 10 years, we would have seen the emergence of, don't quote me on this, but I would venture to say no less than 10 new space agencies worldwide over the last five to 10 years. I know we've seen it. Uh, the Philippines, Australia, a few other companies and uh, countries in APAC um, that have have you know uh, put significant resources into having a space program, and I think that there are going to be a limited number of countries that are capable of doing these very very big ticket uh, type of of programs, uh, and and also probably a couple of private companies in in the U.S. and that other countries that want to partake in such programs are, are going to have opportunities, but it will be you know sort of to a certain extent, uh, on, on China's terms or, or on, you know, on the U.S.'s terms, if it were to be a U.S. program, uh, and so that I think is going to be a, a consideration that other countries and, and indeed other potentially private companies are, are going to to want to make. And I guess that would be one other last point that I would mention is that it will be, I guess, one other interesting thing to watch is whether things like the the China Large Modular Space Station, let's say become open to private space companies to collaborate, do you know, research or do other kind of things, um, that, that will be something to, to certainly keep an eye on. So yeah, a, a really ambitious timeline. So hopefully, you know, they can add oil indeed. Um, nothing else from my side on, on the, the planet. And, yeah. and to go back on your, on your second point on the idea of a big ticket and the economic issues that come with, you know, partaking in such big space endeavors. This leads me to the second point, which um, what which is focused on lunar resources. We had uh, we have a news outlet called China Space News that I mentioned also early, earlier in this episode, and they published a piece in the, uh, in the past few days uh, that was uh, focusing specifically on the economic benefits on exploiting lunar resources. And this could be a way to make the economic viability of um, going to the moon perhaps more appealing um, more appealing, more generally. And even though China Space News is not really an official outlet, or not at all, but they know their stuff uh, generally. And it's interesting that this um, article that came out on exploiting lunar resources came just like a week after Chang'e 5 returned its lunar samples uh, onto Earth successfully. And when you put that together, and also with a lot of um, some past statements that we heard from high-ranking officials in China, we realize how um, how China is really looking at trying to make, I think, their exploration, lunar exploration program, um, to, to have some ec- economic viability in what they're doing, and um, and more generally, I it's it's more about I think establishing themselves. Um, on the moon on, on the long term and it's I think it's 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 a bit different from what we had for example in the 60s where the idea was you know we have this a massive program we go to the moon we do some amazing space sciences for sure but then you know after a decade we come back and then we just leave the moon as is um, for 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 50 years and I think the idea of China right here but also of other con- like spacefaring nations currently is that um, this time when we go to the moon, there has to be some some more economics into what we're doing. It's not just uh, for po- po- political and, and scientific reasons. And when you put that together with some other space statements that I mentioned previously, you have, for example, um, Bao Wei Min, who's the director of the Science and Technology uh, Commission at CASC. And last year, he spoke about something that he called the Earth Moon a Spatial Economic Corridor in 2050. So there's not much detail about what he had in mind, but it shows that there's some economic background when discussing the moon. There was also um, in the article that was mentioned by um, China Space News, there's the um, lunar resources um, 
so including helium-3, an isotope of helium that can use to produce energy on the moon. There's also a lot of titanium, titanium ore, and there's a lot of rare earth metals that can be very useful in electronics. So basically, the article is putting forward a lot of the advantages that there'd be in mining these resources. And there's another high-ranking official called Ouyang Ziyuan, who's the chief scientist of um, the China Lunar Exploration Program. So you don't can't really make this up. And he was really a strong supporter of, of um, this move in China to explore the moon and a supporter of exploiting lunar resources. Indeed, one of my favorite names in the Chinese space program, Ouyang Ziyuan. That's uh, one of those very rare four character Chinese names that you mm -hmm. really only come across probably, uh, I don't know, once out of every maybe 200 people and possibly more if you're in sort of the northeast of the country or in sort of Inner Mongolia. But but certainly in Guangdong, it's uh, not so not so often you come across. Um, but definitely, I, I agree with your point about the um, the emphasis on sort of economic pragmatism to a certain extent. And I think w whenever I, I mentioned anything involving the psychology of the Chinese leadership, I, I use a very large asterisk and say that I'm neither a psychologist nor an expert on the Chinese leadership, nor do I speak on their behalf in any way, shape or form. However, um, when I do think about uh, the Chinese leadership, and in particular Xi Jinping, I, I think um, they are generally economically very pragmatic. And I think that also they are, as I've said before, uh, Xi Jinping is, is probably not a fan of space in the same way that previous, uh, so say, Hu Jintao was a fan of space. I think Hu Jintao may very well have a telescope in his backyard uh, just as a sort of hobby. <laughs> I, I don't know that Xi Jinping would do that uh, in retirement, although he might. I, I, I'm not sure, but I feel he, he might be more into painting, let's say. Um, but digressing, I, I think that economic pragmatism is, is probably going to be one of the bigger drivers of, um, of space policy in, in China. And I think that you know resource exploitation on the moon, even if it ends up not being uh, economically viable, it, it's at least a, a certainly a, a plausible story um, that could be could be you know spun to leadership and it could be you know spun to the the rest of the world and, and also I, I think it, it again opens up opportunities for for collaboration as well where other countries may not have um, <clears throat> such you know resources to go and, and try to get such you know speculative resources. Um, Anything else from your side on uh, on China's moon ambitions? All good. Okay, so we will move into an interview uh, with Sun Jing, the GM of uh, China Satcom, about the company's sort of changing, um, well, I guess the company's changing role in, in China's changing telecommunications uh, value chain and changing telecommunications landscape more generally. So this came out on, uh, on Christmas Eve. The source of the interview was uh, Satellite World's so Awaiting Jie. And uh, Sun Jing was discussing this idea that basically China Satcom in 2018, the company first acquired its um, first class national basic telecommunications license, which um, allowed them to basically sell their satellite capacity as more of a telecommunications service. And at that time, Sun Jing said there was sort of this discussion internally as to whether they should compete or not with the the three existing telcos in China, and the idea was no, we should not compete. You know, this is a saturated market. There's the telcos have you know massive coverage, and we have, we should really just focus on filling in, helping them to fill in the areas that they have not covered. And so he said that you know over these couple of years since they have tried to, um, you know, get closer to the telco, basically use a lot of the same keywords that a lot of the Western satellite operators have used in this context. So you know, getting closer to the telcos and, and doing more kind of 4G and 5G network testing, um, some IoT related services. Uh, he also mentioned an IFC focused subsidiary, um, Xinhang Hulian. So basically it's a um, subsidiary that was founded a couple of months ago um, and it's presumably going to be used to market ChinaSat KA band capacity, which will be ChinaSat 16 and then eventually ChinaSat 19 and 26 in uh, I guess 2023. Um, so that will be, um, it's, it's, I think, noteworthy that China Satcom has decided to try to seemingly enter the service provider layer of the IFC industry. Um, and so again, Sun Jing had, had mentioned that. Um, I would also point out that the, the uh, interview did not mention the word constellation at all, that the Chinese character Xinhua is, is absent from the, the article. Um, and it's, I think, it, 
it's a little bit paradoxical to the extent that a lot of the services that would be, you know, like 5G, this kind of thing, um, ChinaSat does not currently really have enough capacity to serve these kind of verticals with any real significant scale. I mean, you know, ChinaSat 16 is uh, 25 gigabits per second of capacity, and, and they talk about serving IFC, and they talk about serving, you know, 5G in remote areas, and they talk about serving some, you know, emergency kind of vehicles. Um, but at the end of the day, the, 25 gigabits per second, if you're actually selling at scale to any of those verticals, it, it gets sold very, very quickly. And they, I mean, it was very unfortunate that China Set 18 uh, failed on, on launch because really now they, they don't have any more KA band capacity right now until 2023 with China Set 19 and 26. And those two, they're sort of a, um, I guess a bit of a, a predicament that cast is in, in the sense that there's a, a need for more capacity, but the the bigger they make those satellites, I guess the probably the higher the, te the technological risk in the sense that they're kind of pushing their own technological limit in terms of their, their capability to manufacture high throughput satellites. So we'll see. But um, yeah, at the end of the day, interesting interview. Um, I, I would recommend having a, a, a read if uh, if you're so inclined. John, anything from you on the the interview with Sun Jing? Hmm. And I, I think that what what you mentioned, so so the creation of this um um this subsidiary, this IFC focused subsidiary by China Satcom, so Xing Hang Huli, and I think they also I, I zoomed a little bit on the image that was in the article. And I think I saw Arrowsat Link, so I guess that that's their English name. Um, it's interesting to see how a lot of the upstream players are really trying to verticalize um, in the IFC market. And so I think um, like creation of Xinhang Hulian by China Satcom that sort of joins, um, say, Intelsat that's buying the uh, commercial uh, aviation activity of GoGo. And also makes me think of, for example, we had the, um, well, you know, a couple of years back, China Unicom created a joint venture with an IFEC uh, provider and created, you know, um, Unicom Airnet. And so it's also, tel although, I mean, China Unicom is not a satellite operator, it's a telco, but they're also trying to verticalize and uh, go more downstream and serve clients directly. Um, so I think, and, and I think especially in China, and we mentioned the joint venture between Juniao and China Eastern last week, um, a, a lot of things are happening. And um, I think there will, yeah, there will be a lot to report um, in 2021 on what's going on with in-flight connectivity. And I think at the end, it's, um, I mean, it's it's an interesting point that you know China Set uh, and Sun Jing, you know, mentioned that you know the, the company decided they were not going to compete head-on with the telcos; they were going to focus on the areas that could not be connected by the telco network. And one of those areas, I mean, implicitly probably is IFC, and it, it's just uh, we now see that the telcos are trying to kind of uh, connect airplanes through their own IFC subsidiaries, and now China Satcom maybe rightly is saying, oh, no, you know what, guys, we, we didn't try to compete with you as a terrestrial telco, so you guys stay away from from the airplanes. But, you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, Definitely. On the topic of, uh, of airplanes and Chinese domestic, uh, you know, domestic, how would you say? Uh, on the, well, on the topic of airplanes, uh, shall we move to the uh, the MA seven hundred, the uh, the regional jet? Sure. Yeah. To to wrap up this week's of news, we also had a useful, helpful article um, that reported that um, the team from Xi'an Aircraft Company XAC completed the static tests of the MA seven hundred uh, regional turbo prop, prop aircraft. So, what the MA seven hundred is basically is it's one of China's. Um, commercial aircraft currently in development alongside uh, airplanes you've probably heard of, which are the Comax C919 as well as the CR929. Uh, uh, this aircraft was first announced in the late 2000s. It's said to have a capacity of about 80 passengers in a range of around 2,700 kilometers. It will be in competition with the other regional turboprops that you have around the world, so namely the um, French-Italian ATR-72, and also uh, Bombardier in Canada is manufacturing the Q400, so basically those two airplanes. And so what the article was about was the completion of a static testing. And static testing is basically what you have between the design phase of the aircraft and also the flight testing. And this is basically where the engineers verified was today when you design an aircraft, everything is done through simulations and computers. And at some point you have to verify if things are working correctly and as, as you predicted. So this is also static testing is also called um, 
torturing the aircraft. And there's some great videos, not by XAC, unfortunately, but by Boeing and Airbus, where you see like hundreds of cables attached to the wing to various parts of the fuselage. And they're pulling in all directions. And you have sensors all around the aircraft that are measuring the mechanical stresses. And the idea is to see if the aircraft is performing as you had predicted in your um, simulation software. And so they completed that at XAC for the AMAS 700. And that's quite a big milestone because the next step is really the flight tests. And once that and the certification during the flight test is completed, well, that's when you get the first commercial flight. And um, I think that is slated for um, 2023 if the flight tests start next year. So 2023, uh, maybe 2024. And that's, of course, if the sanctions that we mentioned in the past episodes by the U.S. don't uh, kick in because uh, the MA-700, just like the Comac C919, relies heavily on um, Western and most specifically on U.S. technology. So um, that may be an issue and yeah, push the aircraft a little bit back in its uh, initial timeline. Do you have any thoughts on, on the MA-700 Blaine regional turboprop? So I think it's interesting that the the so the name that the Shinjo similar to well I, I guess the the same Jo as the the Quadro rocket which I I like to to see this uh, this Jo making uh, you know multiple appearances in in various sort of aerospace industries. There's also I believe the what is it Huashun Fangzhou as well uses this the the, the sort of uh, yeah the but uh, the, yeah that's um, apart from the from the yeah I think it's it's certainly I mean we've seen. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think this is just sort of the latest example of, or I guess the, the, the latest development in China trying to um, increase its its domestic capabilities at, at producing sort of higher value things. I, I think with this type of aircraft, as um, as you mentioned, with a relatively small capacity, there, there's going to be a lot of demand, presumably between, say, second and third tier cities or between, say, a third tier city and a regional, mm. you know, major hub. Um, but I guess the the question is, I mean, I, a, a lot of these, like for example, what was it last week that the, or I, I fairly recently, the Minister of Railways made a promise to connect all cities of 500,000 people with to the high speed rail network within the next, you know, some within some period of time. Um, and so it kind of begs the question, like, well, if if they're building, you know, that that's it. And and I mean, I think the idea there is is. Um, is sort of investment for the sake of kind of developing the local economy and creating jobs uh, in in a kind of maybe more short term basis, I, I guess. Um, but but either way, I, I think there's going to be a lot of of just infrastructure built to get people around, um, and I think that there's. Um, there's going to have to be some export, I assume, of these these airplanes, just as there's had to be some export of this high speed rail building capacity. So I, I think that this is, um, yeah, there's, there, the, these these are these are going to be big projects for a, a country that has a, a big population, but but that has also built a lot of stuff already. So it will be interesting to see. I, I agree with you that there's a competition from the railway. I think that wherever the MA seven hundred will find its uses is um, typically. I remember when I was um, on holiday in Hunan two years ago, I went to Changjiajie and. Uh, there was a connection with Changsha at some point, but I think you had a, a very mountainous area uh, mm. between um, Changjiajie and, um, and, and and Changsha. So basically, when you had to go from one place to another, uh, the railway just had to circumvent the entire mountainous area. And you ended up like having to take the train for six hours where it'd be maybe 30 minutes or I don't know, maybe an hour max tops mm. uh, if it was through um, through the plane. So I think maybe mountainous areas, not just Hunan, but I'm thinking maybe uh, Qinghai, Tibet. Um, the, these are places that could take advantage of that. Um, I think there's also the fact that um, turboprops, they need much shorter railways, uh, sorry, runways to land and to take off compared to um, uh, jet engines. That's and so um, they potentially could land in areas where, um, well, you know, say the C919 or the... Uh, ARJ-21 couldn't land. Um, and I think there's also at the end also the idea of exporting the aircraft. There are a lot of uh, smaller com companies, that, uh, sorry, countries that would be interested in the aircraft. I think they also mm. have some orders already from Cambodia. And I think countries, island countries like um, Indonesia would be, could be interested. Very there's good always point. the question yeah. of certification. But, um, but I agree with you definitely. I think regional jets is a niche. Um, compared to um, typically the C919 and just these 
narrow body 150 to 200 passenger aircraft. Mm. Yep, no, that's a good point. That is a very good point. Um, okay, anything else from your side on the uh, on the MA700? I'm all good for today. Okay, so just a couple of last housekeeping notes. This is, as mentioned, the last episode of 2020. We would also like you to um, be on the lookout for our upcoming interview with Dong Lu of Comsat, which will be out sometime next month. So be on the lookout for that in the month of January. We expect to uh, to have that out. Although the we well, the month of January we can we can with 87 percent certainty. Um, that being said, this is uh, this has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined by Jean Deville. We will see you next year and hope you have a happy holidays and happy 2021. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Bye.